Sometimes in a game, a developer might want to convey something that can't be presented very well through normal gameplay. They may want to warn the player of a new threat, encourage them to look into a conversation, or teach them how to use a new mechanic. And in order to subtly project these ideas, the dev might try a few different things. Most commonly, a game will just throw the player into a cutscene, but this isn't perfect. Cutscenes are great for their ability to show movement or changes, but taking the interactivity out of a game frequently, for a long period, or even just at the wrong moment will end up annoying a player when they're trying to get immersed. This doesn't need to happen though. There are plenty of alternatives to cutscenes. Sometimes there's just a better tool for the job. For example, don't you hate it when your control is taken away every time an important NPC shows up since the developer can't risk you killing them off so early? Well, what would happen if the scene were just conveyed in a slightly different way? Number 1. Fixed Perspective This one's probably the shortest departure from a regular cutscene on the entire list. It's just a cutscene in front of a camera that the player controls. I think it's done best when the perspective is that of a character who's either confused or injured. If your vision's all funny and you just want to see what's going on, then it's pretty easy to imagine yourself in the shoes of a weakened protagonist. I've seen some games do this with all their cutscenes, but that doesn't make too much sense to me. Why would I move a camera around if everything I need to see is right in the center of the screen? Now, giving the player control of the camera doesn't get rid of all the problems. One of the shot's major flaws is that the game's director isn't in charge of the camera angle anymore. While it's easy to influence where the player looks, they may think that this new agency they've been given means that they should explore the scene. Therefore, they may do a bad job of following the action and miss something important while they swing the camera around. That's why I think it's a good idea to use the opportunity to hide easter eggs, characters, or elements that serve as foreshadowing in these segments. Otherwise, the player is literally just going to be moving their head around looking for nothing. But for a different tone, you'd have to try a different technique. Number 2. QTEs In my experience, quicktime events either work perfectly or horribly. On the upside, they can give you a sense of tension, replicating what a character in that scene might be feeling, something that a traditional cutscene might struggle with. You might feel desperation, pain, hype, or whatever the cutscene is trying to convey. However, on the downside, you might be relaxing playing a video game or watching a cutscene when all of a sudden you just get jumped by brightly flashing lights telling you to do something, and before you think you're dead. If a player is going to be expected to do a QTE, I feel like they should know that it's coming. That's only fair. Other than that, my biggest problem with QTEs is that it feels like developers just throw them around expecting the player to succeed without really tuning them for failure. Defeating a difficult boss only to screw up on the QTE afterwards and getting instantly killed is pretty much the worst. On the flip side, I tend to like QTEs that you're forced to lose, or at least aren't expected to win at. I feel like that perfectly conveys trying your hardest, but not being strong enough. A personal favorite of mine is the quote unquote boss fight with Strangelove and Peace Walker. You'll most likely fail your first time through and get captured by the guards, but if you focus up, you can actually make it past the 14 inputs you'll have to time correctly and grab her ID card. You still end up captured and thrown into the torture chamber, but you'll be able to escape a lot easier, making it literally just a get out of jail free card. Speaking of unbeatable bosses though, let's speak about unbeatable bosses. Number 3. Unbeatable Bosses Out of the 7 things on this list, this is probably my favorite concept out of all of them. No matter how hard a game gets, players always know that it is, at some point, beatable, right? When you're thrust into a fight that you actually have no way of winning, you feel weak, like you failed. It's a great setup for an action game where you're supposed to feel powerful, and it makes you feel all that much stronger when you finally get back to the same situation later on and actually win. My only gripe with this setup is when the player realizes what's going on. They shouldn't know they have to lose, or else it won't actually have any effect. Revengeance is one of my favorite games out there, but I have to admit it relies on this trope a bit too much. There are three separate moments in this game where you're put up against a threat you can't defeat, and they all put you into a different weakened state. One breaks your body, one breaks your will, and the final boss breaks your unbreakable sword with a smirk. All these moments are fantastic individually, but I feel like it confuses the player whenever they reach one of the game's many difficulty spikes. On a few occasions I ask myself, this guy seems really tough. Am I supposed to lose here? Should I just let him win? Though I guess that's its own problem. A better example would be the tendrils in Shadow of the Colossus. Every time you kill a boss, you're given a brief breather before you get completely filled with black tentacles. Unlike Revengeance, the no-win scenarios are completely different from the regular fights and don't cast uncertainty on any of the winnable ones. Not only that, but the repetition allows the player to go from being shocked the first time to dreading it the next, and uh, struggling against it and perhaps even eventually giving in. The player themselves gets to go through their own little character arc. How's that for immersion? Number 4. Scripted Events 
Here's another sometimes iffy technique that's super interesting when it works. Scripted events are basically just cutscenes that take place in game, sometimes with interactable bits. Everyone remembers the pick up that can sequence from Half-Life 2, when the player reaches a certain checkpoint an enemy throws some garbage in the floor and tells him to throw it away. You can be obedient and do as he says, or you can make a statement and take a beating. It can be super rewarding to have the game so directly put you into the story, but they're usually unskippable and when they break, they break pretty hard. I consider the Phantom Pain's fragile scripting to be one of the game's biggest issues. Scripted events are best when the player is somewhat involved with them, but I guess that can be somewhat difficult in a stealth game where one of the most basic interactions the AI has with you is freaking out on sight. There are a couple missions in the game that have less than stellar scripting. One example is this mission called the War Economy. The idea is that you listen to the dialogue of this man you were hired to kill and you realize that he isn't so bad. But since one of the mission objectives is to listen to all the dialogue, and since getting spotted prevents all conversations from triggering, you end up just watching these two character models stand still and talk with almost no emoting. It's not that you can't interact with it, it's that you're encouraged not to, which makes this mission so tedious. That's not the worst example though, that'd be Traitor's Caravan. Here you're supposed to track down a vehicle and get sneak attacked by the skulls. The problem here is that the scripting doesn't actually make any sense. When you throw the can at the Combine Soldier, his scripting is to hit you because that's a normal reaction for that. Here the idea is that if you stop the car during a chase, then you have to fight the skulls, but that logic also occurs if the enemy has no idea that you're there. Since you're supposed to listen to all the dialogue in this mission too, I believe that the intended route is that you tail the convoy and just listen from a distance. Of course, I got overzealous and tried a slightly more elaborate route, but when the vehicle naturally came to a stop, the skulls burst out anyways. The skulls aren't designed to be snuck around. If they aren't in an alert phase, they're just going to walk towards the player until they are. You have to fight them. It's a shame because if the scripting were just a little bit more polished, then this mission might have actually been really cool. It stands out for there to be such a noticeable flaw in the logic here, because a lot of the game is really well polished. Number 5. The Hallway This one is just what it sounds like. A long corridor you walk down, while things maybe happen or don't. It's a fairly simple design, but it's deceptively effective. The imagery of someone marching forwards fits into a lot of niches, and the player even gets to participate, especially if they're still digesting something from earlier on in the story. Not to mention, the length of the hallway can easily be stretched out if a character needs to get some lines in or if something needs to happen. Since just holding forwards isn't much input, the player is going to be expecting some kind of change, so the hallway is great for giving a sense of anticipation, confusion, or even fear if the genre fits. It's a pretty flexible tool, you see this type of thing more often than you'd think. Here's a sad one, here's a goopy one, here's a rad one, here's a spooky one. They're really all over the place. And while I think they do their job, you can't just throw them around. If the environment's uninteresting, or if it's a repeat playthrough, the player may just feel unengaged, which is a bummer because these bits are typically pretty long and not always skippable. Plus, it has to flow with the game's tone. No one likes to go from a radical fight scene into a walk and talk. Typically, I'd also group this type of sequence in with another type of playstyle, but it isn't really what I consider to be a alternative to a cutscene. So, maybe I'm cheating with this next one. Number 6. Environmental Storytelling Alright, so the reason we want alternatives to cutscenes is because sometimes the developer wants to get new information to the player without diminishing their sense of presence or immersion in the world. So, when I say to just directly place that information into the game's environment and let the player stumble into it, I sound like I'm saying the player doesn't need that information, which isn't what I want to say. As an internet video game man, the obvious example to point to is Dark Souls, where any revelations about the legacy of these magic metropolises turned ghost towns are reverse engineered just through left behinds and deductive reasoning. But like I said, that's kind of the obvious example, and the good thing about environmental storytelling is that you shouldn't really notice it happening. It's a subtle detail that redefines the context of the game. Portal could have just been a puzzle game, but the tinted windows and prying cameras unsettle the player and set up that exciting, subversive ending. Environmental storytelling is basically the antithesis to a cutscene, where instead of highlighting an important piece of info, the dev just lets the world exist, whether that be with interesting level design, or just a lull in the action. Number 7. Pure Audio and Text Ending off with a strong one, MP3s and JPGs. When I started making this video, I was only going to bring up the flaws of audio logs and random notes in gaming, but the more I think about them, the more I ended up liking them. They have a bunch of advantages that I didn't think of at first. 
They allow the player to know about scenes that happen in the game independent of their character. They can serve as rewards for players to explore the overworld and find secrets. And as long as they don't interfere with other important audio or visuals, they never seem too intrusive. On the con side, since they don't give the player anything to look at and since they're never really that interactable, the player might feel unengaged and just feel like they need to sit down for story time. This makes it even worse when the audio is very critical for understanding the story and missing one log might just confuse the player, especially when there's a lot to listen to. I was also going to complain about how they lack visuals and movement and how I felt that since they're so easy to just toss into a game that I always felt like they're a cop-out. But now that I think about it, they have their own art to them. The horrible torture scenes from Ground Zeroes, the vague item descriptions from Dark Souls, and all the human relics in Talos Principle are also effective because you never really get to learn everything about them. One last detail to realize is that these techniques aren't mutually exclusive either. In tons of games, you can find several of them working together to form a more complex sequence. If you know what you're looking for, it can be pretty amazing how quickly some games can jump from one style of storytelling into another. Having too many cutscenes can bore the player, but so long as the player's actions, the depth's vision, and the game's design all synergize together, these tricks can be used one after another to not only hold the player's interest, but to more fully immerse them in the game.